Hey, everybody. This is Chuck Marone. Uh, welcome to our celebrity edition of Ask Me Anything. Uh, our celebrity this month is uh, Stacy Mitchell. Stacy is the author of uh, the book Big Box Swindle, which I actually, I don't know if I've told you this, Stacy. I own three copies of. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Uh, she is with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, she's in Portland, Maine today. Welcome, Stacy, to uh, Strong Towns. Ask me anything. It's so nice to be here. I'm such a huge fan of Strong Towns. I feel like we're all simpatico with our work at ILSR. So it's always fun to talk with you and your audience. That is that is very kind of you. The the uh, the Mutual Admiration Society is in effect because I do I do love your work and I particularly I I know. Um, during the Amazon HQ2 stuff, I kept seeing just amazing stuff you were, you were producing. And I said, oh my gosh, we have to have Stacy on the chat. So thanks for taking the time to be here. Yeah, so happy to. I, I want to go over some of the, uh, the ground rules here for the people who are attending. Um, we've got uh, someone like a hundred and some people signed up to be part of this today. I see people trickling in as we go. We're up uh, mid 40s now in attendees. Um, here's how this is going to go down. Uh, we're going to spend the next eight hours chatting. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to spend the next roughly hour or so uh, going on uh, here. I'm going to kind of kick things off. I've got a few things that I would like to ask Stacy about. Um, but if you have a question, this is an opportunity for you uh, to get your question for her uh, in play. There's a little Q&A button, and on my screen, it's in the bottom. Uh, I think in yours, it might be on the side. It's a little bit different uh, for, for, for me than for you. Uh, but I want you to go ahead and in the Q&A part, uh, enter your question in. It will pop up on my screen. And when we get a little bit into this, I will start to, to moderate those and, and pick through those and, and pass those on to Stacey. Uh, questions that are um, shorter work better. Uh, questions that are more to the point work better than uh, ramble. Uh, I know you know this, just uh, just kind of kind of state that there. If you've got any other like off topic things that you want to ask, Daniel is here on the video call with us. Daniel, say hi. No. Hi, I am here. <laughs> I had to unmute my audio for a second. Oh, that's cool. You're a professional. So Daniel's here with us. Uh, Daniel's going to be looking at the chat as we go. And if there's anything that comes up, uh, you can uh, chat with him and, and he'll try to help you out and figure things out. Um, Stacy, the first question I've got is what's the temperature where you're at? Uh, it's about 20 degrees. 20, oh, 20 above. It's a balmy, it's a balmy 20. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that you have Minnesota, Minnesota roots and uh, will appreciate the fact that uh, when I got here today, it has warmed up to minus 14. So, nice. Uh, yeah. I, I'm kind of envious. I sort of want to be there right now. I remember those crazy cold temperatures. You, I believe, and I, we don't have to get into this, but I believe you're a little bit younger than me. Um, back when I was in college was the last time I remember this happening. Uh, it was really frigid cold. So this would have been 92 or 93. And the governor canceled school everywhere. Like just, it was Arnie Carlson who came in and said, school across all Minnesota is canceled. It is too cold. And we didn't have, they were threatening that this week. Um, I think schools just voluntarily, like my kids are off the next two days. No school. They're cheering. They think it's great. Um, they don't realize they're going to have to go in June when it's really nice now. Um, but you remember those days, right? Oh, completely. Um, you know, I went to McAllister and then I lived in St. Paul, uh, I was there for a total of about 10 years, college, and then afterwards. Um, and uh, I can remember I had this job during college at a coffee shop, and I had to be there at five o'clock in the morning because we opened at six, and so someone sure. had to come in and get everything going. And it was only maybe mm, six blocks, eight blocks from my apartment, but I can remember on one of those negative 25 degree mornings, you know, you're completely covered up, walking to the coffee shop, freezing there's no one anywhere right and i get there and my key will not work in the lock and i think i can't make it back to the apartment like i'm gonna drive <laughs> the street right I can't get into a warm place right now i mean it, it's really it's a different kind of cold than we get at least in coastal maine yeah 
Yeah, it's like you're walking through the desert and realize you don't have enough water to make yes. it back. Um, yeah, no, uh, I've, I've, I've experienced that to a degree. Um, let, me, uh, l- let, me, let me switch into some technical questions for you. And I, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the big box stuff, but I, I, I want to um, start with Amazon mm-hmm. HQ2. Um, this was a... Uh, kind of bizarre process that, uh, that, that played out. And I, I, I want to start with just your impressions on maybe from the very start, uh, what Amazon, what, what you looked at as like Amazon's kind of, um, I don't want to, I was going to say predator. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want you to be able to elaborate on this, but basically the, the position that Amazon put itself in to start out this process um, I, I, I want you to maybe go back to the beginning and, and kind of s- talk a little bit about where you see them as when they started this, when they made this kind of broad proclamation, like, Hey, we're doing HQ two, everybody line up and, and, and let's, you know, let's, let's see, uh, let's see where the chips fall. Wh- wh- what do you think they were with their kind of intentions and approach and, and why initiate something in this way? If you're Amazon. Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, we don't know exactly what they were thinking, um, but having watched the process closely, um, so they announced, I want to say it was about a year and a half ago-ish, they came out and said, we're going to have a second headquarters. Uh, We've kind of outgrown Seattle. We need a full-on second headquarters. Um, And we're going to put 50,000 people there over a 10-year period. And uh, here are the kinds of things that we're looking for in a city and send us your proposals. Um, And 238 cities, mostly in the US, a few in Canada, uh, submitted very detailed proposals. And in some cases put a lot of taxpayer money, a lot of public dollars on the table uh, in the form of subsidies and tax breaks. I think Maryland offered uh, around $8 billion, for example, and there were other offers in that kind of price range, just huge, huge amounts of money. Um, You know, Amazon seemed at at once to, I mean, in a sort of strange way, they wanted a publicity boost of this. You know, this was an incredibly splashy way to kick off a bidding process. Um, And they seemed to want to kind of ride that as we are the new job creators, we are, you know, everything they were sort of getting out of that visibility. And at a moment in time when people were beginning to be concerned about their market power, you suddenly had all of these mayors, you know, trusted local officials across the country singing Amazon's praises. I mean, you can't buy public relations uh, benefits. Uh Uh-oh, is that me that, uh... Stacy? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I got you, I lost you there for a minute. Just keep going, you're good. You can't buy public relations benefits like that. And so that's how they started out Um, and you know, they both wanted sort of all that PR, but then they also wanted to control information. And when they began, as the process went on, they suddenly told cities, oh, you've got to be secretive. You can't release all this, these bids to the public. So you had citizens in different places whose local governments were offering Amazon who knows what. They didn't know. They had no involvement in the process. It was very undemocratic. Um, it seems now, you know, and then they whittled it down to 20 cities at some point and did a big announcement around that. And then, and then finally uh, picked both DC and Queens, New York, uh, just outside of DC and Virginia and Queens, New York, uh, splitting the headquarters in two um, so-called headquarters. It really seems in retrospect that this whole thing was a charade, um, that the kind of technical talent that they needed um, couldn't really even be found in one city. There are very few places where you can find people with those kinds of skills. And it also seemed clear that there were a lot of reasons for Amazon to be in the nation's capital, having to do with buying influence and being influential with government, and also to be in New York because they've got a growing ad business, it's the financial capital. Um, so this all seemed very foregone and they got, you know, in doing this, they got a lot of visibility. They got, they helped bid up the money that they got from cities. You know, people were competing, they created this frenzy. And they also gathered a huge amount of data. You know, cities turned over an incredible amount of information 
to Amazon, which Amazon will put to prodigious use and which is not available to its competitors. Um, and this is a company that uses data to gain an advantage. I, 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 I want to talk a little bit about the city reaction, the municipal reaction to this. Um, it, it's no surprise to me or, or, or to you uh, that cities pay for ridiculous things. Uh, big box stores all the time get massive subsidies to locate in communities. Uh, I, I think maybe though this was a little eye-opening for people who are not like intimate with this uh, because it happened all at once across a whole you know country. W what did this kind of expose in your mind about the city process of deliberation on these things, particularly when it comes to uh, maybe transparency or responsiveness to their own citizens. Um, did this, uh, did we reach any new highs or lows or did this just kind of maybe reveal what people like you already understood was going on? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think it did, it did reveal something, a very dark part of uh, how cities operate and, and it's relatively new within the last few decades. It hasn't always been this, this way. Um, it was in some sense a new low, um, although there are precedents, other mega deals like this and lots of sort of smaller, but still very large deals. You know, cities give away about $70 billion a year in incentives, tax breaks, and sometimes just direct cash subsidies in the name of economic development. And we know from uh, research done by the organization Good Jobs First, that something like 90% of those dollars go to the largest firms. So effectively what cities are doing is they're putting their thumb on the scales to favor the big guys. And meanwhile, you've got local business owners, you know, putting blood, sweat and tears into growing businesses, often coming into places, downtowns and so on that, you know, they're really helping to lift up. Um, they're getting none of those advantages and yet their biggest competitor, um, is getting these huge handouts to fund fund their growth. It is often, um, it varies a lot by city, but in the worst cases, it is an entirely behind closed doors process. Sometimes it's even led by a, um, like a chamber of commerce or other non-governmental entity that is actually authorized by the city to enter into these negotiations. And they partly do that because then they're outside of the legal obligations to disclose information. Um, so it's a dirty business. There, it, it arises, the history of it is that there used to be site, site location consultants that rose up and said to big companies, hey, we'll help you find sites and we'll help you get some tax breaks while you do it. And they have driven the growth of this and cities have been you know, just to put it bluntly, I think suckers for going along with this and not getting together and saying, wait a second, no way, you know, Amazon wants to come here. We need to talk about what Amazon is going to do to mitigate its impacts, not what are we going to do for Amazon? One of the things that we at Strong Towns tell cities all the time is that, you know, if your neighbor wants to lose money on an investment like this, why would you try to outbid them? you know, try to lose even more money. Like this, these are, these are losing investments. Um, and, and we try to sell people on the idea that if you build up a good ecosystem of local businesses and a good workforce and, you know, a high quality of life and you attract people to your place, uh, these large businesses are going to want to be there. You're not going to have to subsidize them. They're going to want to be there. Then we look and we see Queens and DC and that theory that I put forth for years kind of feels a little flimsy now. Why is a place like New York City, which I think and arguably is like the, one of the greatest cities of North America, a, just a, a magnet for talent, in a place like DC, which is our nation's capital, which you know even during the depths of the Great Recession was seeing property values appreciate and people move in, why are these places subsidizing an Amazon? It's a it's a great question. You know, there's going to be a city council hearing in New York tomorrow. And so it's the second, I think it's the second one there. Even they've got another one coming in April looking at this. So they kind of grilled some of the Amazon people. The city council was actually locked out of this process. They've had no, they have no authority in any of this. It's being done by the mayor, Mayor de Blasio and by Governor Cuomo. 
Um, you know, I don't know the answer. I can say that, you know, New York City is a place where real estate and financial interests have a lot of sway over government. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Governor Cuomo has a history that has led some to argue that he's quite a corrupt governor. Um, and, you know, I think you have a situation where you have something unfolding where, I mean, the response from people on the ground, from, from residents of New York has been, hell no on the subsidies. We don't even know if we want Amazon here at all. Um, and right. so- We already have housing shortages and yeah. Right, and they, you know, they see this future of a local business economy and being dominated by this sort of monopolist enterprise. And, and look at Seattle. I mean, Seattle's got a host of problems because of Amazon and is, is very dominated by that company. And so I can see, you know, I certainly was glad that I lived in a place that was small enough not to be in the running because it would really scare me to think about my beloved community being taken over by, by Amazon. What do you think, and, and you, you know, your organization gets, feels a lot of questions all the time, You're very active in this space. How do you think this HQ2 uh, process has affected our dialogue as a country. Do you, do you think this is a, a point where maybe people are stepping back and asking a different set of questions or is this maybe solidified, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of dog eat dog kind of sense of, of competition amongst governments? Where do you think we're headed? Yeah, I think, Overall, I think that, that this was a wake up call and that a lot of people saw behind the curtain uh, something that goes on more routinely that they weren't aware of um, with regards to the economic development, so-called economic development spending that cities are doing. Um, I think it was also a wake up call about what Amazon is really up to and that I feel like there was, there was a moment when Amazon purchased Whole Foods when a lot of people kind of looked up and went, wait, what is this company? I thought this was an online retailer and sort of started to realize that there was a bigger ambition. This was a, a, an even bigger moment of people sort of realizing what is at stake when you start to have a company that has really monopolistic intentions on your economy and really wants to kind of gain control of both the infrastructure, but also have a really influential um, really wants to, to, to envelop government. Uh, and you know, we're sort of seeing that with what they're doing with defense contracting and the way that they gamed both of these states, you know, Virginia and New York. Um, so I think it was, uh, I think in the end, we may look back and, and, and recognize that Amazon miscalculated on this. And I think they actually figured that out around September. I think their decision to kind of add Nashville to the mix was partly trying to kind of cover, you know, to, to sort of dodge the growing realization that this whole thing was a terrible ruse and that the richest man in the world's walking away with public dollars that really needs to be spent on schools and places and all the things that you guys talk about. Um, I, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you a couple other questions. And one of them is an opportunity for you to push back on something that, that I've said, but let, let me, let me lead with this one. Um, I, I, one of the reactions that I get sometimes when I talk about, uh, localism versus the Amazons or the big boxes. Um, and, and even like we had a pharmacy come in here in my hometown and I'm on the planning commission here and, and, you know, tried to make the case for uh, dealing with the Ma and Pa pharmacy in, in a way that was slightly different than what we would do with the, the chain pharmacy. Can you make the case uh, that what you're about is not uh anti-markets or anti-competition or anti, you know, even, even if we want to say capitalism in like a pure Adam Smith sense, you know, people taking their money and, and deploying it in a community to make places that, that you're not like some, uh, you know, socialist communist overlord wanting to come in and, 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 you know, circumvent the, uh, the market system. I, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of, push back on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out what the best way uh, to do that is. I certainly, we're big believers in markets. And what we would say right now is that um, markets aren't uh, uh, working properly because we, you know, the, the role of government is to write the broad rules that structure markets. And part of the role of government is to write the rules that ensure open markets, that everyone can participate, that markets are fair, that there's true competition 
Um, and we know that that serves people well over the long run. It also serves democracy well, that there's a way in which uh, not allowing some big players to kind of game the system for their own benefit is part of living in a democracy. Um, so that's big picture. You know, I would point to as an example of one of many that we uh, research in our work, um, the state of North Dakota. So North Dakota in the 1960s uh, banned chain pharmacies. All of the pharmacies, essentially, there are few grandfathered, few that were grandfathered in, but all of the pharmacies in North Dakota are locally owned independent pharmacies. And we thought, well, that's a great way to like kind of study, like what is, if you only have local businesses, what's the outcome? Is it different? So we did a study a few years ago and took a, a close look at North Dakota. We found that North Dakota has more pharmacies per capita than any other state in the country. That if you live in the smallest communities in North Dakota, you're twice as likely to have a pharmacy in your community than if you live in the smallest communities in South Dakota. That if you live in the cities in North Dakota, that you have far more choices. You as a consumer have lots of different pharmacies to choose from. If you live in a city in South Dakota, you often only have a couple, you know, CVS, Walgreens. Um, and that North Dakota has among the lowest prescription drug prices in the country, and that they have better health, health outcomes because pharmacies are providing more health services. So you look at that and you say, well, independent pharmacies can compete. And if they can compete so well, why is it that they're disappearing in so many places? You know, if they can compete in North Dakota, why can't they compete in Nebraska and New York? And the answer to that riddle is that there are these things called pharmacy benefit management companies. And I know I'm getting into the weeds of the healthcare system, but these things are called PBMs. And they sit between you and your insurance company. They determine which drugs your insurance company reimburses for, and they set the reimbursement rates for the pharmacies. They're supposedly there to control cost. There are two that control 80% of the market. Most Americans are only dealing with two of these companies. One is CVS Health. Another is Express Scripts. They both have their own mail order pharmacies. CVS obviously is the nation's largest drugstore chain. So if you go looking, what happens is that these companies deliberately under reimburse local pharmacies and then try to steer that business to themselves. The reason that North Dakota, that doesn't happen in North Dakota is because there are only local pharmacies. It's not an option, yeah. <laughs> the PBMs have to deal with them. So that's sort of what we're saying is like, let's create a fair playing field. Let's rein in these PBMs. Let's stop giving subsidies to big business. Let's get the tax code fair so that local economies have a fair chance to thrive. Let's stop using the farm bill to give 90% of our farm subsidies to the biggest farms. You know, if we go down the list, there are so many ways in which policy is working in favor of the big guys. And if we level that playing field, and if we recognize the various benefits that local businesses bring, I think we'll get very different outcomes. Uh, when Kia Wilson, who uh, it works, has been here for a, a more than a couple of years now, when she first started, her and I had a long debate over Amazon. She comes from the book publishing industry. I come from a, a, a place of not, uh, of, of, really struggling with the productivity of big box stores mm -hmm. and kind of the negative impact that those have on our financial resilience. We, we came to different conclusions on the Amazon effect. Um, she was uh, very much kind of, I think in, in, along the lines of the way you have historically approached it. And she talked about monopoly power and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I talked about in terms of undermining uh, the big box stranglehold and basically allowing people to re-inhabit urban neighborhoods uh, where there wasn't retail up the street, there wasn't grocery store up the street, there wasn't some of the things without having to get in their car and drive out to the, the, the meteor belt out on the edge to get daily essentials. I, my argument was people first and then the retail will follow. I, I've, I've come a a long ways towards Kia's point of view and your point of view, largely because of your work and because of some of the, uh, I think, persuasive arguments that she has made over the years. I, I want you to have a chance to push back on maybe the chuck of the arguments that I in 2016 made, which is basically in terms of Amazon, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If I'm, uh, if I'm not a fan of the big box stores, but I am a fan of urban living, uh, why should I um, still maybe reserve some skepticism 
for the, the brown box that can be delivered within 24 hours to my house. So why is that not just like a great option for me in, in urban life? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, I will say just for people who really want to read into this, because I'll give you a little bit of a sketch, but we, if you go to ILSR.org slash Amazon, you can connect into a lot of our writing and research on Amazon. And in particular, I think probably a good place to start is with a, story, a piece I did for The Nation magazine last February, um, which is a cover story for them and, and that or any of the, the other things that are up there for people who really want to learn a little bit more. You know, I think that there was, you know, I, I did when I, I remember reading that piece of yours and, and sort of feeling this sort of like, uh, the animosity you have towards big box stores and they have finally met their match. And I, I understand that uh, very much <laughs> my own work, uh, how, how that would feel, feel appealing. I think we have to understand Amazon is that they are not just looking to be a big retailer or a big anything else. They are looking to own the infrastructure for the economy. Um, you know, what we're finding when we talk to uh, independent retailers, small manufacturers, all the businesses that we really need to have healthy communities, to create jobs, to like anchor local economic activity, um, you know, they're, we're going to live in a, in a world that's both bricks and mortar and online. And these businesses want to offer online to their customers, and that's a thriving thing that we're all going to enjoy, and we're going to do both things, right? The problem is that even just a few years ago, uh, a business could be successful online. They can have their own website and do that. Today, more than half of all shoppers, when they want to buy something online, simply start at Amazon. They don't go to Google and get a bunch of different results. They start at Amazon. And that's a function of Prime membership, and we can talk about why that is. But people who join Prime don't comparison shop much. They tend to just start there. And what this means is that every other company that wants to reach consumers online increasingly has to ride Amazon's rails to market. They have to become a seller on its platform. And about half the sales on Amazon's platform are through third-party sellers. It's everybody you can imagine. It's small manufacturers, big manufacturers, it's independent retailers, it's just people who do online selling, everybody. Um, and we know that Amazon uses its position as a gatekeeper to undermine these companies as competitors. It watches, we know from Harvard Business School studies, that it watches what the third-party sellers are doing and it pulls their most, uh, their best selling products into its own inventory and then gives its top, itself top billing and search results. Amazon is manufacturing a growing number of goods that it sells. Uh, it's using information it cleans from sellers to move into adjacent markets and become dominant there. It's no coincidence that most of the best selling books on the Kinder, Kindle bestseller list are Amazon published books, or I should say many of them, maybe not most. Um, so this is a, a company that's really a voracious um, monopolist. And what it's doing essentially, you know, if you think about it, you know, what a market should be in a democracy anyway, a market, and we can think about it in the most simple terms, like a, a farmer's market, you know, it's like we decide what the rules are. Okay, it's going to be on Wednesdays, it's going to be in this location, everyone's going to have access to get a, a stand, we're going to have somebody who's going to make sure the weights are equal information, access to information is going to be pretty equitable. Like, you know, any farmer can see who's selling tomatoes at what price and who's got a lot of people lined up at their stand. Like that's a market, right? Uh, at least in a democracy. Amazon is creating, um, it, is, it, is, it is replacing the market with a kind of private arena where it sets the rules, where it has a godlike view of everything that's going on in that market, but all the players have no information where it can levy a kind of tax for access through the fees that it charges to sellers. I mean, this is a very fundamental thing that it wants to do to our economy. It's, it's, you know, as bad as Walmart has been, at least Walmart only wanted to dominate, you know, all of our retail economy. Amazon's designs are much deeper. And it's not just the platform. They want to do this with package delivery and logistics. They're going after UPS and FedEx. They already have essentially have done this with the cloud. They own about 40% of the world's cloud computing capacity. Everybody from Netflix to the CIA relies on Amazon to host data. Uh, and on and on it goes pretty soon as uh, voice becomes the interface between us and all of our products, our dishwasher, our car, everything else becomes voice interface. It's going to be Alexa and Amazon is going to have inserted itself again between a user and a, and a product or a seller. 
Uh, and when you insert yourself that way, you have a lot of power. I know I've been talking a lot, but I, I want to say one other thing, um, which is it, it would be sort of as though Walmart came into your town and not only set up this big store on the outskirts of town, but then bought up all the commercial real estate and got to decide, okay, who can have a business? Which do they get a good spot or a bad spot? Here's what they can sell. Here's how they're allowed to interact with their customers. And here's what they have to pay Amazon. Uh, and, and they have to turn over all of their data and information to, to Amazon. Um, that's essentially what, what is going on. We wouldn't allow that offline and we shouldn't allow it online. I've been monopolizing the questions and uh, we've gotten quite a few now <clears throat> submitted. I I'm going to go to Daniel. Uh, Daniel B. Uh, submitted uh, this question. Can you explain self-reliance differences between rural and urban as it pertains to big box internet retailers? So when we're, when we're looking at rural areas, urban areas, and, and we get into the big box uh, realm, what are, what are the major differences there that, that, uh, that you're experiencing? Yeah. Well, I mean, some of these that come to mind initially, you know, in smaller communities, um, you know, part of the strategy that Walmart and other big box retailers pursued was to build stores that were really oversized for those communities. And it was a way of, of, of kind of owning the market because you could sort of flood the market with so much excess retail capacity that smaller businesses um, inevitably, you know, they could just lose 10 or 20% of their customers and they would sort of start to be in the red and, and disappear and then you could become uh, the retail market. And, and towns, I think, were really, you know, have not been very smart about recognizing, with some exceptions, recognizing that you need to scale the size of the store to be appropriate to the size of the community and the size of the market. Vermont is an interesting place for um, because they have a statewide land use law that gives and sort of insists that communities be a little smarter about these things. Um, Vermont has only, I think it's five Walmart stores and three of them are much smaller than a normal Walmart and were placed in existing buildings like an old Woolworths in one case, for example. So they have that option there, it exists, but um, they also have lots of small businesses. They have the largest number of small businesses per capita of any state in the country. And it's partly because they've been a lot smarter about not just letting the big boxes kind of overwhelm. Um, you know, with urban areas, uh, you know, I think it's, I guess scale really matters in both places because as I'm thinking about it, you know, what makes urban places urban is that you've got a lot of different uses all on one block. And that again, really um, is, you know, it matters if you've got, you gotta have a lot of small spaces. In New York City, one of the things we've been seeing is the big boxes have wanted to come in there as you'll see like Bed Bath & Beyond buy an entire block knock down all the walls between the storefronts and then have a huge bed, bath and beyond. And then you end up with a block that's not urban. It's not what Manhattan should be. Right, right. Um, let me ask you this one from Jordan. Uh, Jordan says uh, he works for a small planning firm. One of the things that city leaders ask them the most is, uh, what are options for getting a grocery store when we can't get any of the grocery store chains to set up? And then he puts in parentheses, are co-ops the right answer? Are there places where co-ops work better than others? So maybe two other two two sets of questions. What do we do when we want a grocery store, and the big the, the big chains won't come in? And then what do you think of co-ops? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think one insight that we had about looking at this problem of of places without grocery stores is that the chains would be there if they wanted to. Um, like a lot of states have responded to this problem, the federal government has responded to this problem by offering tax credits, um, and you know that would be potentially useful to a chain because they have tax taxes that they would like to offset with credits. But the problem is they don't really want to be in those neighborhoods. They have other places they want to deploy their capital and the barrier is not a tax credit. It's that they don't want to be there. Um, local operators um, would in many cases like to serve those communities. They can't really benefit from a tax credit because they don't have anything to offset. Um, and so that's not actually a useful policy for solving that problem. The barrier for the local entrepreneurs 
uh, is usually about capital. It's about getting loans. Um, because if you go to a bank and you're an independent or a small chain and you want to go into a poor neighborhood or a place that's kind of doesn't look like it's got the right demographics, you know, try getting a loan. You know, that's a hard lift. Um, Pennsylvania solved this problem with something called the Pennsylvania Fresh Food Financing Initiative, um, which was smarter than all the other states because it was a loan program along with targeted assistance. And they opened about 100 um, local grocery stores across the state in both rural and urban places, all underserved, all pretty much locally owned. Some were like chains of like 10 stores locally owned. Some were like little green grocers, little co-ops, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful in kind of thinking about the problem, uh, but, but if I, not knowing kind of where you are, the thing that I would think about is, are there, is there a good grocery store somewhere in the region that someone might want a second location and how can we make that happen? And then I think the co-op option can work. Um, there are good examples of that. Um, and there's an initiative called Co-op 500, I believe it is, that's working nationally um, to help seed a new generation of food co-ops and, and in fact has, has done that. There are quite a number of them that have opened. Um, I clearly there, you know, it depends on how well they're the people who start them run the business and how much they engage the community and wanting to be active members. Um, I think people with grocery store experience is really critical because it's a hard, it's a hard industry and you really have to know it. Um, John uh, is asking a question about, I'm going to try to paraphrase it because he wrote it a, a little long. He's asking a question about basically the uh, efficiencies of scale. Mm -hmm. When we have a big box store, they've got all these kind of supply chain efficiencies that they can build into it uh, to be real competitive on price. Mm -hmm. And he asks a question, you know, if, if smaller retailers got together, uh, could they work together and create such efficiencies? Is there a model for that? Um, and he asks, you know, if, if they sacrifice a little bit of their independence, could they basically overcome some of those challenges? And I, I wonder how you would respond to that framing as well as that question. Hmm. What do you mean by the framing? I'm just curious. Well, I, I think, you know, we look at uh, often the advantages of say a Home Depot over the local hardware stores being I can get the hammer cheaper at Home Depot. And so ergo, uh, Home Depot is my preferred place. And I've heard you make other arguments that maybe would frame things a little bit differently than just yeah. being price competitive. Yeah. Okay, so I think there are a couple of things that I, I would say, or three things I'll say here. One is I, I do think that we need to enlarge our sense of our economic well-being to not just be so uh, in a consumer mindset about everything. There's a growing body of evidence and, and we've written about it and, and a lot of economics research now that's finding that one of the, reason that the reasons that wages have stagnated and that we've got growing inequality and that a lot of people really have not, most families haven't seen any improvement or maybe have gotten worse in, in about 30 years um, in terms of their economic condition is, um, is because of consolidation. That, there, that in a lot of ways, as we move to this more consolidated economy, there are less and less opportunities for people to move into the middle class. Um, there are different places you can go and read about that that sort of unpack why that is. But I think that's an important thing to note um, and to remember that part of what we need from our economy is not just what it delivers as consumers, but what does it deliver in terms of opportunities for us to make a decent living and have a meaningful life. So that's big picture. Um, as to the particular question, I mean, the answer is, is yes. And I think you look in the hardware sector and to some extent the grocery sector, you'll see good examples of this. So in the hardware sector, virtually all independent hardware stores belong to a national co-op, either Ace or um, True Value um, or Do It Best. One of them just merged or disappeared from being a co-op and I'm forgetting which one. But anyway, um, in the case of, of of the co-ops, these are owned by the local stores, so they run them. They're not a franchise or a chain or anything like that. And if the if Ace makes a profit, it goes back out to the local stores. 
Um, but they get volume discounts, they get centralized distribution, they get sort of national marketing. They give up a little bit of independence, though they do have a lot of control over like, what their store carries and how big it is, you know, all the sort of things. They make those decisions themselves. Um, I think it's a great model, at least in certain sectors, and there are there's data showing that independent hardware stores on average are absolutely price competitive with Home Depot and Lowe's. We often make assumptions about prices at big box stores that data suggests are incorrect. Um, those stores are very good at um, doing things like having certain kinds of products priced really low. Um, and it creates an impression about prices that if you actually go through and look more closely is not true. Um, Consumer Reports is always fun for this. I mean, they have found that if you wanna buy an appliance, for example, uh, the best place is an independent appliance store. Don't go to uh, Walmart or Home Depot or Best Buy if you need either a large or small appliance that it's gonna be much cheaper than independent, independent appliance stores belong to these buying groups. So that's part of it. Um, so yeah, is that, is that because that's where they make their money? Like they get you in on like cheap, uh, you know, end cap items and, and give you this, this illusion that it's cheap. And then when you're not, uh, kind of bargain shopping or value shopping, you, uh, you pay the premium. That's right. I mean, there's sort of two ways they, they do it. I mean, one is that they, I, I, there's a word for it in the economics literature and I forget what it is, but there's a type of product that most of us kind of know what the going rate is. Mm -hmm. They're really cheap on that. It might be milk, for example, a gallon of milk. They always make sure they'll undersell, they'll sell that for less than they pay for it. Um, and then they'll have higher margins on things that we don't know in our heads um, what the going price is. And so we'll pay a bit more for that and not, and not realize it. The other thing that they do is they, um, in some cases they get, they're selling products that seem identical, but if you actually look, there's a different model number than what you would get at the independent store. And the manufacturer in order to meet Walmart's demands for low prices has found some ways to cut corners. It might have plastic parts on the inside instead of metal. So in the end, you may have to replace it more quickly and therefore you're not actually saving money. They do have some efficiencies, but then you know, you've got to think about, well, what does it really mean when you lose all these jobs, when you've got goods that are being transported from China and the kind of environmental cost. I mean, so there are other ways you can start to kind of cloud this. And I think when you start to look at it much more holistically, it's not really clear that we're getting a great deal. I want to go to a question by Ursula, which I'm really flattered that Ursula is uh, listening to this and is a member of Strong Towns. I had I had no clue, really. My kids are were huge uh, Under the Sea fans. What was that show, The Little Mermaid? Um, so whoever Ursula is, great name. I wonder what the uh, alternative strategy might be if a company wanted to be transparent and democratic. Uh, is there a different public process or a better public process that Amazon could have used? If you uh, step back and, 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 and look at this, and I, I think for Amazon HQ2 maybe, but, but also just for, you know, if, let, me, let me flip this around, I think, to make it even a better question. If, if you're working for a city or you're active in a local community, and you want a, a, a better, more level playing field. You want a more competitive environment, um, but you're not in a position where you can say, ban all chain pharmacies across the state. You just gotta, how do you, what, what, would, a, what would a transparent process look like? Like how would you go about setting something like that up? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and I think, I think this is um, something that, that there's a lot of, of a lot of economists and, and others who look at economic development have concluded, which is that it's it's more you get more bang for your buck investing in universal goods, so infrastructure, good sidewalks, um, you know, uh, uh, making sure that you're not sprawling out in every direction, education, um, parks, you know, all of the ways in which you can invest in making a great place. Those are the things that are going to both attract businesses, but also create a, a kind of environment in which local entrepreneurs have a chance to take root and grow. Um, and education in particular is really, there's a direct link between investments in education and the economic benefit that comes out of that um, to your city. 
So in general, I think that what we should do with this $70 billion that cities and, and local governments spend on economic incentives, economic development incentives, you know, a lot of that needs to just go back into investing in our places and that will yield the dividends of its own um, without government stepping in and sort of playing favorites. Um, and then I think we can take some of it and do some really targeted kinds of things. And it might be, you know, looking at a business district that is just so, has become so vacant, you know, a neighborhood business district where it's really hard for any one entrepreneur to come in there. I mean, they can pioneer it, but they're gonna be all alone on the block and it's gonna just be really hard to turn around. So how can a city might think about, well, let's do three or four or five years of stepped up um, rents. Like we'll subsidize rents in a sort of stepped up fashion over time, they'll go back up to market rate will create this sort of an incentive to get a multiple businesses coming in at once. Like that seems like a smart use of money that you could open up to a variety of different kinds of businesses. I think there's some interesting stuff going on that we're um, doing some reporting on right now and, and, and we'll publish something on at some point in Portland, Oregon, where they, Portland uh, Development Commission, their kind of economic development arm, is slowly reorienting at least part of its uh, focus to be more on entrepreneurship. So they've started these cohort-based education uh, initiatives to help entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, learn from one another and get started and have the know-how to start a business. They have an affordable commercial tenanting program to create affordable space for new businesses that are starting up. They have a number of other initiatives, but they're just sort of like holistically rethinking what would it look like if we devoted our resources to more like an entrepreneurial model and a kind of grass ground up and very incremental, which is a word you guys use a lot and is an absolute favorite um, concept of mine, because I think that's that's where you get durable, real change and growth that, and development that matters to people over time. Right. I, I want to put a question up here from Daniel, another Daniel. Uh, who's a little bit, I don't know, it went off my screen, a little bit pushing back on you. And I, I want to give you a chance to respond to this. Um, so I'm going to read the whole thing. It's a little bit long. He said, well, I also question the wisdom of cities providing multi-billion dollar subsidies uh, to the wealthiest companies and agree that the competitive playing field is tilted toward the largest corporate players. Stacy lost me when she makes comments like, and then there's a, there's a quote here, Amazon wants to dominate government imputing a malevolence to companies like Amazon. Uh, her comments expose a hostility to the companies themselves rather than the legal and regulatory framework. Wouldn't it be more effective to address that issue rather than attack the companies which have taken advantage of the regulations, such as what was done with Standard Oil in the early 20th century? So maybe a little like nuance on the conversation, but I want to give you a chance to, um, to, uh, to, to respond to that, that question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree very much with the notion that it's on us as citizens and on us through our government to set policy. I mean, this is not about, um, you know, companies are going to behave how they behave. It's up, up to us to decide what the rules are, what the limits are, how we structure markets. Um, but I do think we need to understand that Amazon's intentions are not necessarily aligned with the public interest. And I think there's a lot of evidence of that. Um, I think when you look at, for example, the fact that they are uh, uh, increasingly, um, they're up for a, a $10 billion contract to host the data for our Defense Department, for the Pentagon. Um, they already have a contract to host data for the CIA. The so-called JEDI contract, which is the one they're up for right now, um, they, you know, there's this sort of revolving door that has happened where someone who worked very closely at Amazon went to work for the Pentagon, headed up this project. The RFP was designed in such a way that other companies don't quite qualify. It really looks like an RFP written for Amazon. We had an amendment come through Congress at the same time that people around the Hill referred to as the Amazon Amendment that directed federal government to change how they do their purchasing and to switch to a particular kind of e-commerce portal. Again, moving federal purchasing online is one thing, but the way that this was written, it seemed very much like the only person who could fulfill this directive that passed through Congress was Amazon. 
Uh, Anne Rung, who was the chief uh, uh, person in the Obama administration for purchasing, is now heading up Amazon's uh, government uh, uh, division. So I think when you start to look, it's like, no, it is a company that actually wants to profit off what it can get out of government. Um, you know, we see it in the warehouse subsidies, we see it in the HQ2, we see what it's doing with the Pentagon. Those are its intentions, um, and I think that that's true, and I think it's, it's worth understanding that. That said, it's up to us as citizens to say, why is it that the Pentagon's got a former Amazon staffer who worked at the Pentagon for a year and then went back to Amazon um, and used his time at the Pentagon, apparently, to uh, kind of steer things in the direction of this company? Why do we allow that? Um, why don't we have Congress doing some oversight? Uh, why don't we as cities get together and say, you know what, why are we, why aren't we forming a kind of union, if you will, not to be taken advantage of when companies come calling with these jobs and we kind of have more of a unified response to how we want to handle these proposals. So I absolutely agree with where the locus of decision making is, but I also think it's worth, you know, it's easy for people and people in Congress to think, well, Amazon's a sort of you know, benign influence, it's an online retailer. And it's like, no, I think we need to understand who's on the other side of this table and what they really are after. Let me ask uh, this question from Michael. Uh, what would be seen as the most effective, uh, the, huh, Kia, I think it's Kia Manny, taking care of the questions here. When you click on it, I, I, it flips and I lose it. So give me a question, give me a chance to ask it before you click on it, if you wouldn't mind. What would be seen as the most effective disruptor to the Amazon monopoly? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so I talked about Amazon a little bit as, as, as a railroad, um, which is, I think, an important analogy. You know, back in the um, late 19th century, we had the railroad come along, this hugely disruptive technology that was great in, in many ways. One of the things that happened is that there were a few uh, industrialists, uh, J.D. Rockefeller and others, who gained ownership of the railroads uh, in different places. And they used that ownership to disadvantage their competitors and other lines of industry. So uh, yeah, my railroad's only gonna carry standard oils, oil to market. And if you're an oil competitor, sorry, you don't get to go. Uh, you don't get to get your goods to market. And they also used it in some cases to uh, extort money from small businesses and farmers who had to ship their goods by rail and, and were kind of had no other choice but to pay whatever the fee was. That's actually what led to our first antitrust laws. And um, in 1906, in particular, Congress passed a law that said if you own a railroad, uh, you can't also have a stake in commercial goods. You can just be a railroad and you also have to be a common carrier, meaning that you have to treat all comers fairly, same rates for everybody. And that really helped to establish the railroad as an open infrastructure that worked for the whole economy. Everyone had uh, equal access to it. I think we need to think about how a platform, uh, an e-commerce platform might also need to be subject to a similar kind of approach. Um, Amazon and, you know, if Amazon both owns the rails that you need to ride to get to market, and competes against you, there's a real conflict of interest there. And there's a lot of evidence that Amazon uses that um, conflict of interest, uh, that it undermines the, the competitors uh, on, on, that, it, that are on its marketplace. So that's the kind of general principle. Um, I, I will say that um, you know, our anti-monopoly policies, our antitrust laws, they played a really important role um, from like the 1930s through the 1970s in making sure that places across the country, that we had a decentralized economy, that every community had an opportunity to grow up businesses that could compete locally and regionally and maybe even nationally. One of the things that we've had, so in the 1970s, 1980s, we really abandoned antitrust. Um, and I won't get into the whole story of that, but we really shelved it. There's a movement now to bring it back, and we're very much part of that movement. One of the con many consequences of having gotten sort of gotten rid of not not enforcing our antitrust laws anymore. Um, it's what allowed Walmart to grow to the size that it is. It's what allowed Amazon to grow. Both of those companies use tactics that would have been illegal a generation before, um, if we were, and, and still are illegal. We just don't enforce the laws. One of the consequences of this consolidation is that we now see a handful of metro areas that are doing well. 
you know, almost all of our new business growth and our job growth has been in a handful of mostly co coastal metros. Meanwhile, lots of other cities have lost headquarters as companies have merged. They've lost their small businesses. And we're seeing a lot, most of the other sort of small towns, second tier cities, rural areas, really stagnating economically. And you know, I think when you think about, I guess I would say thinking about sort of the strong town's mission of lots of places across the country being thriving and everyone kind of uh, having great communities. Uh, Anti-monopoly is a really critical part of that strategy. How can cities, and this is coming from Brian, how, how you know what, before I ask this one, because I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking here, but I, I want to go back to the monopoly one just for a sec yeah. with my own like interjected question. I, I, I listen, uh, I don't listen to cable news at all, except occasionally I will turn on CNBC um, more to just make sure that like, I'm not losing the, the dialect and the lingo. Right. Um, you know, it's like, it's like a foreign tongue and I have to, you know, you got to practice it every now and then. Um, one of the things that I pick up in financial news is the, the pricing of Amazon. Mm -hmm. And there is a certain, I think, acknowledgement that Amazon's valuations right now today are based on an assumption of market monopoly. And, you know, that ultimately, like the only way you justify those P-E ratios and, and the, uh, the valuation is if someday it, it is like the 98% market player. Um, there's also kind of an acknowledgement, and I might have even heard a quote from, from Bezos himself, but I, I know from within the company that there is a kind of belief that at some point in the future, they will be broken up, like dismantled AT&T railroad style. Is that inevitable? And, and I guess if, if that's inevitable, what are the things that are... Um, what, what are the things that would either need to happen to make that happen? Or what are the things that are keeping that from happening right now? Yeah, um, I think it is inevitable. Um, I don't think that we want to live in a future where you have a company that has that much sort of power and, and gatekeeper power in particular. Um, I think the more people and certainly lawmakers look closely at what's happening and the more that they see the consequences of it that I think we do get to that point. And, you know, I think it's very, it's, it's, in, you know, what, what is then incumbent on us, I think as citizens is to have a vision of what we want in the future. And, and you know, for, for me and, and for ILSR, that's a vision where, you know, we have all of the advantages of online shopping but it's a market that's fair and open and where all kinds of businesses can compete and thus our local communities can both be, can be thriving places where we can shop in person or shop online with those businesses and maybe we're shopping with businesses elsewhere as well, but that this is a, is a truly thriving market with, with real opportunity. Um, I think that can happen with the right set of policy tools, um, but I think it's on, on us, I think, you know, to, to sort of have that vision. And, you know, part of my challenge, I think, in doing this is not only sort of articulating like why, why we need to intervene here and why I think that is really crucial, but also to articulate what the future looks like and, and to remind people too that we've been there in the past with the railroads, with the telephone monopolies, with Standard Oil, Microsoft even, um, you know, Microsoft. That case was really what made possible Google and a whole bunch of other innovations was sort of controlling what Microsoft, limiting what they wanted to do to block competitors. So we have to remember that we have a history of, of intervening with monopoly laws in a way that's produced really good outcomes. I say it's inevitable. I, I, I think it is. I think there are growing numbers of people uh, you know, sort of seeing what's going on here. I think if we don't intervene, um, we will find ourselves in a country 10 years from now that we don't recognize and that is not a place that's actually democratic. I, I'm, I'm going to give uh, Brian the last question because I started mentioning him. Um, he wants to know about TIFF. And mm -hmm. he, uh, in two separate questions here, back to back, talk about his city being really, uh, have a, a lot of TIFF projects going on and uh, using them for kind of like these big development bets. 
his essential question is how can we break out of our bad tiff habit? How do we, uh, how do we stop this kind of spiral of tiff? And I, I think there's maybe an easy answer to that, like quit, but there's a more complicated answer. And I'm maybe going to, going to push you a little bit to delve into the, the deeper, the, the deeper kind of Zen zone of why we find tiff so seductive. Yeah, I know it's it's TIF is is you know it's a form of subsidy, but it kind of gets masked. I think this is part of why it seems seductive is there's a kind of like oh well we we were not, we weren't going to get this tax revenue anyway, so it's kind of like not really a subsidy. And it's like a lot of times the but for part of that isn't really actually demonstrated. Um, and you know TIF was designed initially. The idea was for places that were just so. Uh, so far gone, like so blighted with existing falling apart buildings that it was going to be more expensive for a developer to, to come in there. And so therefore we were going to give a little help, particularly in kind of low income blighted places. Um, and that makes some sense. Um, but now it's exploded where it's being used a lot on suburban green fields for, you know, shopping centers, which just doesn't make any sense at all. I kind of think that in this I, more broadly true. I've seen it. You've seen it, yeah. Oh my gosh, many times, yeah. Yeah, St. Is it St. Louis? Yeah, the the, the nine uh, jurisdictions that make up the metro of St. Louis did a study a number of years back and found they had spent it was tens of millions of dollars and they had no net increase in jobs because most of what they'd done with TIF was just subsidized retail development and they move jobs from here to over there and then over to here and then down to there and nothing had changed except they right. lost all this money. I kind of think that it's so hard for cities and local officials not to fall into this trap. As much as I believe in kind of local authority, I sort of wonder if what we really need to do is at the state level kind of get together. It's sort of like making a New Year's resolution, you know, where you decide, no, I'm really going to exercise three times a week and you create some kind of accountability for yourself. I sort of feel like as citizens, as local officials, we kind of got to go to the state level and say, all right, we're going to really reform this and we're going to set some serious guardrails around when this can be used. And we're going to just sort of, instead of having to make the decision in the moment where we're faced with a thing that we want to say yes to, like the piece of cake, you know, we're going to have to make the decision earlier. We say, nope, we're not going to eat any cake and we are going to go to the gym. Um, there's a lot of good questions here. Marty has got a fascinating one. Rick has got one. I want to respect your time and also the time of the people who have uh, joined us today. I do want to ask, Stephen uh, had a question and I have the same question. Uh, what happened to Stacy when she couldn't unlock the door to her workplace in minus 25 degree weather? Uh, <laughs> I did eventually get in. It's, it's an old building with a beautiful old door and it was one of those like jiggling things. And I think it was partly a little bit like sort of the cold had changed the metal. Yeah, so you jiggled. It didn't work very well either. I had big gloves on and my fingers were completely numb, but I did eventually get in. But it was, it's more like the panic of that because you realize, I don't know if I can actually survive, like literally survive. <laughs> Here. <laughs> it wasn't one of those what's the story maybe they didn't make you read this in grade school but i had to read it like three times where the uh, the guy's out on the ice and he's freezing and he realizes he's gonna die and he tries to like get his dog to come to him so he can have you ever read this am i am i oh, oh it's a horrible story it's it's a horrible <laughs> story have you read but it in school it's boring oh yeah no i i read it like many times in school for some reason it's a horrible story because it's the guy, he's out, he's somewhere far from civilization. It's like minus 50. He realizes he's going to die unless he can start a fire. And his hands start to freeze and he tries to get the dog to come to him so mm -hmm. he can actually kill the dog, warm up his hands inside the dog and then start this fire and the dog is smart and doesn't come anywhere near and the guy dies. That's the story. It's a horrible story. I don't know why as grade school kids we have to read this, but anytime I hear like, you know, I was there and I was trying to jiggle the key and I couldn't get in and I knew I couldn't survive like walking back. I'm like, right. You think of that. Gee, just if you're a dog, just run from those people. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lesson of grade school. That's a, that's maybe a Minnesota grade school uh, story. I miss we're a, uh, we're, we're loving people, but we're also pretty hardy, right? Uh -huh. um, 
Stacy, thank you so much for your time. I, I do. I just want to say this again. I, I do um, love your work and deeply admire what you do. And, and I have to say for myself, uh, I have found you and, and the way you approach things to challenge a lot of my assumptions uh, in ways that I've found to be to be helpful and, and, and productive. And you have changed my mind on a number of things and opened up my thinking in ways that uh, I, I, you know, are hard to appreciate. So I just want to thank you for the work that you do and for taking the time to be here. And if you're interested in more uh, from Stacy, it's ilsr.org, right? That's right. And thank you too. It's and to do more of our mutual admiration society. There are several things that I can think of right off the top of my head where you had an insight about something that has now, I, and I share it with other people and I say oh. go to town towns to learn this because it's like something that has cut through the conventional wisdom in a way that is just a really special. So, and you incredibly useful. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I feel like we, uh, we have a great partnership in terms of pushing on these same things from a, from a different, uh, a different, a different starting point, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will be turning this into a podcast, so you'll get to uh, get to hear this. And and for those of you that didn't get your questions answered, I apologize. Uh, we do what we can, and I'm sorry I hogged up a little bit too much time myself, but that's uh, my prerogative. <laughs> Stacy, uh, stay warm and have a nice uh, a nice rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody.